Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Charles Shapiro, President of World Affairs Council of Atlanta. Our program today is on systemic racism and policing, a solution-based discussion. Um, our program is brought to you by the board and the members of the World Affairs Council. I want to give a special welcome to Mark Becker, the president of Georgia State University and a member of the World Affairs Council board, and to Bernard Taylor, chairman of our board of directors and the moderator of today's program. Our panelists today are Paul Butler. I'm going to give a brief introduction of each. Uh, uh, our Paul Butler, who is the Albert Brick Professor in Law at the Georgetown University Law Center and a legal analyst on MSNBC. He's been profiled on 60 Minutes, Nightline, ABC, CBS, NBC Evening News. He just said he was being interviewed this morning. Um, Professor Butler's book, Chokehold, Policing Black Men, was published in 2017. Washington Post named it as one of the 50 best nonfiction books of 2017. Professor Butler served as a federal prosecutor with the Department of Justice. His prosecutions included a U.S. Senator, three FBI agents, and several other law enforcement officials. He's a graduate of Yale University and Harvard Law School. Dave Wilkinson is the CEO of the Atlanta Police Foundation. Dave joined the foundation in 2005, uh, after retiring as the special agent in charge of the United States Secret Service Georgia region. During his 22-year tenure with the Secret Service, Dave served as the special agent in charge of the Office Investi of Investigations, as well as the assistant special agent in charge of the Presidential Protection Division, serving under Presidents Clinton and George W. Bush. Dave was awarded the Distinguished Service Award from President Bush for supervision of agents and his actions on September 11, 2001. Linda Williams is the 43rd National President of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, Noble. She is a professor of practice at Middle Tennessee State University, her alma mater, uh, and she is in the Department of Criminal Justice Administration. Ms. Williams had a 29-year career in the U.S. Secret Service, retiring as Deputy Assistant Director in 2017. Among her assignments, she was the Secret Service Country Attaché in South Africa. Um, where she was responsible for Secret Service operations in 21 countries and managed oversight for the visits of then Vice President Biden and former Presidents Clinton and Carter during the 2010 uh, Soccer World Cup. She's also a frequent contributor on our news media, including this morning. And Ms. Williams is an active member of Kappa Alpha, Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. <laughs> our moderator is Bernard Taylor. He's the chair of the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. He's an arbitrator and mediator at Judicial Arbitration Mediation Services and he is a recently retired partner of Alston and Bird, an Atlanta law firm, and a former Detroit police officer. Now to our audience, if you have questions, and I hope you will, please use the Q&A function on the bottom of your Zoom screen. It says more, click on more, and there'll be a drop down in one of those is Q&A. Please use that, not chat for your questions. And as the person who's going to read your questions, I ask that they are short and to the point. Today is the one year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. When Bernard Taylor, if we'd be interested in a program on systemic racism and policing, our answer was you bet. Here's a, here's a couple of data points before we begin. There are almost 18 thousand law enforcement organizations in the United States from city and county police and sheriff's departments to state and federal level law enforcement. An average of three people a day are killed by police in the United States. Blacks are twice as likely as whites to be killed by police. I'm going to stop there. We've got experts on the panel. You don't need me. Menard, I'm going to mute myself and turn this over to you. So, Bernard. All right, thanks, Charles. Great, greatly appreciated, man. Um, 
And thanks to all of you in the audience who have uh, uh, agreed to participate in this very important discussion. And thanks to our panelists for agreeing to uh, lead us through this discussion and help us to understand the various uh, solutions to this problem. Now, this problem of uh, systemic racism in policing uh, has, uh, uh, it's not new. It's, it's been going on for decades. I, I can recall when I was a police officer back in 1970, almost 50 years ago, well, it was 50 years ago, um, there was a unit in the Detroit Police Department uh, uh, with the known by the acronym of STRESS, T-R-E-S-S. -S. And uh, the name was Stop the Robberies and Enjoy Safe Streets. Now, many of you who may be as old as I am will know that back in the 70s, uh, there were a lot of robberies and problems in Detroit. Uh, and this unit was created in order to try to tamp down those robberies by having a decoy cop who would uh, be out on the street and if someone approached that person to try to rob him or her, then his team would come in and arrest that person. That was the idea. Uh, but over the three year period that that organization, that unit was in existence, 24 people were killed by the police officers. 22 of them were African-American. And one police officer in that unit killed six African-Americans over a two year period. Uh, now, I don't think that would be tolerated today. And of course that organization was, was that unit was abolished. Uh, but today we're still dealing with similar problems. Now, we didn't plan to have this program during the uh, one year date of the, the death of George Floyd, um, but I'm, I'm glad we're doing it. Uh, so during our very brief period of time today, I, I hope that we can provide insight into realistic solutions to the negative impact of racism upon police practices in the US. Now, let me give you a little bit of background information before we turn our panelists loose. Um, those of you who uh, registered for the program should have received a TED talk by Dr. Philip uh, Antiba a golf, who is um, a professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and at Yale, and is one of the co-creators of the Center for Policing Equity. Uh, and basically, Dr. Golf uh, believes that you can use data to try to um, address the issue of um, racism in behavior, racist behavior by police officers that's causing injuries and deaths to the people they interact with. He calls it the uh, data science for justice theory. And he, his theory is based upon the following uh, three uh, aspects of his research. Uh, one was that one in five Americans interact with law enforcement yearly. Uh, one million of those encounters result in the use of police force. And African-Americans are two to four times more likely than whites uh, to have force used against them. Now that's the results of his factual research about what's going on in our, in our country. And so he then proposes the following um, activity that he hopes if they can develop data from it, it will um, eliminate or tamp down the amount of uh, police injury or injuries by citizens occurred as they relate uh, or encounter police officers. One is that he uh, thinks that you should use data to determine the areas of high incidence of police force use, and then determine if there are problems that social services providers would be better able to solve, and then provide those services, those social services first responders to limit the need to call police to deal with the behaviors caused by those problems and then study the result of that solution has on the impact of police use of force in the focus areas. Now, we're gonna hear from our panelists whether or not they agree with um, Dr. Golf's theory. And then there are also some popular police training programs 
programs or initiatives that we're gonna talk about some today. Uh, one is the de-escalation of training, which is the diffusing of volatile situations uh, encountered by police. Uh, implicit bias training, which suggests ways to identify and counteract hidden uh, bias that may affect police actions. And the duty to intervene training, which is very fascinating. I'll be very interested to hear what our panelists have to say about this. And it's where police are being trained to intervene to prevent their colleagues from using inappropriate force in various situations. And then of course, the, the social services uh, professionals uh, being the first responders where that's appropriate. So now let's get started. We'll, we'll start with Professor Butler. Paul, you're quoted in The Guardian to have said the following. I worked as a prosecutor, then I was arrested. The experience made a man out of me and it made a black man out of me. Can you explain to us how that experience impacted your work as a prosecutor and how it has directed your academic focus. I was the junior lawyer on the most high profile case in the Department of Justice. We were prosecuting a United States Senator for public corruption. And while I was working on that case, I got arrested and prosecuted for a crime that I didn't commit. It was a, a silly little misdemeanor, a dispute about a parking space, but it was a huge deal to me as it is for every one of the 12 million people who get arrested every year. And that includes half of black men by the time we reach the age 23. So in my case, I went to trial and I tell that story in my first book, Let's Get Free. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what happened because I want everybody to buy the book. <laughs> But BT, I'll give you a hint. Things worked out fine for me. Things worked out fine because I hired the best lawyer in town, Michelle Roberts, a black woman who now runs the National Basketball Association Players Association. Things worked out fine for me because I had legal skills. I had literally prosecuted people in the courtroom where I was being prosecuted. Things worked out fine for me because I had some privileges. We made sure juries knew about those fancy schools that I went to and that I was a prosecutor, things that shouldn't matter, but do. And the other reason things worked out fine for me is because I was innocent, but that didn't seem like the most important reason. I think I would rather have been guilty and have Michelle Roberts as my lawyer than innocent and had a lawyer who didn't have the resources or the expertise to fight my case. And so I didn't have to leave the Justice Department after that case, but I couldn't go on in the same way, uh, learning what I learned about our criminal legal system. All right, and that, that brings us to, thank you, and, and that brings us to um, the, another book you wrote, um, the book called Chokehold, and, and Charles um, uh, related to it earlier, and, and the subtitle that uh, deals with policing black men. And in that book, you uh, uh, state a theory or a belief that the criminal justice system does not work for African-Americans, particularly for black men. Can you explain to us why you believe that? And you may have already explained a little bit of it. Uh, and um, uh, what's your support for that? Chokel started out as a guide for black men, how to stay out of the system and then what to do if like me, you catch a case, how to have the best outcome. But while I was writing that book, Trayvon Martin got killed. And then Michael Brown in Ferguson and Sandra Bland in Texas and Eric Garner in Staten Island and Freddie Gray in Baltimore. And suddenly a, a guy for black men 
didn't seem to meet the moment. Trayvon Martin didn't need a male role model. He was on his way to his dad's house when he got gunned down by George Zimmerman. Mike Brown was supposed to start school, college, the week after he was killed by the Ferguson police. So I wanted to explore the reasons why our criminal legal system is so ineffective and so focused on race rather than public safety. And my idea in Choco is that the main problem is not bad apple cops. As a prosecutor, I work with police officers and FBI agents every day. I don't think there are any more races than anybody else. The main problem is that the system is working the way it's supposed to, to target black men. You say to target black men, Can give us some examples of what you mean by that. So there's a lot of data that tells us that black men make people nervous. For example, one study shows that when a white person sees a black man that she doesn't know, a part of the brain that is associated with fear is activated. And it hasn't always been this way. It wasn't until after slavery ended that black men were stereotyped as dangerous or criminal. And that helped make the criminal legal system a substitute for slavery and allow the police to do some of the work that overseers had done. And since then, the politics of criminal justice have been dysfunctional, more about imposing a racial order than about public safety. And black men are certainly not the only subjects of the state's fast power to arrest you and beat you up and lock you up. Other groups, including black women, Latinx people, transgendered people, especially transgendered women of color, don't have it any easier. But when we ask how things got so bad, why the US locks up more people than any country in the history of the world, why police are, are so violent, why prison conditions are, are so degrading, Understanding this anxiety about black men helps us understand how we ended up with this wretched system. All right, well that, that brings us to the point then, and thank you very much for that, um, of this issue that a lot of us listening into this webinar have heard a lot about, and it's this defund the police initiative. Can you tell us what you understand that really means? And, and what are your thoughts about that as a way to deal with the problems you've just discussed? Discuss, excuse me. BT, defund the police is a slogan. And it means different things to different people. Uh, what it means to most people is reallocating some of the money that goes to police departments, to community service organizations like violence interruption programs, mental health counseling, providing quality housing and treatment for people with addiction. And what this recognizes is that most 911 calls are not, are not about serious violent crime. That's less than 5%. Most calls are about someone who's in some kind of crisis arising from a relationship or a mental disease or addiction or homelessness. And if the first responders are people with guns, that can make things worse, not better. And police officers are the first to say that they're not trained. They don't have the skills or resources to deal with many of the problems that folks call them about. The more radical view is that the fun means the fun. So this looks at policing as a successful project in racial subordination and control. Uh, it looks at the origins of US policing and slave patrols and, and asks, well, why would you want taxpayer money going to that? 
So the fun, the police is intentionally inflammatory. It gets people's attention. And the way that a lot of jurisdictions have responded is by defunding the police, especially looking at that first description of taking money away. For example, police officers in, in schools and, and, and not using the money for that, but using that for community building programs. And BT, in some ways, that's not that different from some of what Professor Goff has proposed in the way that you described it. I want to come back to you in a few minutes about your thoughts regarding uh, Professor Goff's theory. But let me let me move on to uh, to Linda, President Williams. Um, and Linda, you you are uh, the president, national president of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, as Charles explained, Noble. And as I understand it, a, a part of your basic mission is to serve as the conscious of law enforcement by being committed to justice by action. So I want to, and I know that you have created a task force, and that uh, task force purpose, purpose, I'm sorry, is to reimagine or reimage public safety in the US. Can you kind of tell us a bit about your thoughts regarding this defund the police initiative and about what your task force is focused upon and what recommendations you've made uh, through your task force activity? Well, Bernard, thank you for continually having this uh, uncomfortable conversation, but much needed conversation. Uh, even more so for a time such as this. I concur with my colleague, Paul, um, you know, when we say defund, it was, a, it was a battle cry by Black Lives Matter. If you ask different individuals, they come up with different definitions. But it is just that, that as we look at ways not to take money away from law enforcement, or realign, reallocate, or even appropriate additional funds, there's an over-reliance in our society today, and it continues that law enforcement is called upon for everything. Uh, there are a lot of things that have nothing to do with law enforcement, but we are that entity. So what we need to do is realign those that, that funding uh, with social services as we are continually plagued with mental illness, which is so huge, but yet uh, underfunded in our community, homelessness and drug problems. And so even as we help to realign with these these Ill illnesses in our society, when we realign it, we don't take the money away from the department, but how we, we morph, morph it, I should say morph it into social services that you, know, you can't take law enforcement out of it because there's always the propensity of danger. And so law enforcement still have to go in when a person is having a mental episode. But at the same time, that crisis intervention team is also you know, notified that they are coming there because they have the expertise to de-escalate where law enforcement don't. So again, we should uh, realign and reappropriate how we do these to better serve our communities. And so it was one of my, um, one of my pivotal uh, agenda items as we reimagine public safety that I created a task force. That task force was uh, co-chaired by two past presidents, uh, Cedric Alexander and Clarence Cox. And then we had representations from our organization on every level, from the municipalities, the sheriff's office, state and federal. And what this report did is provide a roadmap, a strategic roadmap, and how we reimagine public safety. But to be strategic enough that even as law enforcement lessens its footprint, but that we do not jeopardize the safety and security of those communities. And so I'm proud of this 90 day task force that came into fruition in March. Uh, Noble is often asked to you know, be a co-signature or sit at the table with others to co-sign on legislation and, and other you know, edicts about law enforcement. But being Noble and over 50% of our major chiefs in the country our noble members in, uh, of course, noble started out as a predominantly black law enforcement organization. Mm. Our membership expands across the gamut now. And so who better to tell the story? So I decided mm. that we would set the table, that we would invite academia, special interests, you know, federal, 
and all these other stakeholders in our community and have their buy-in. And of course, we were under, you know, had a undersigned or uh, through a law firm that created this and Gibson Dunn's was so gracious and to bring this wonderful um, report to fruition. And I think you've shared it with your members, but what's strategic and what's great about this, it doesn't just give statistical data, it gives recommendation and sustainable and actionable solutions that communities can enact to help that, to help, you know, reimagine public safety. How does it look? You know, it doesn't take a congressional mandate that we can better understand one another, that the communities can respect law enforcement, but better so that law enforcement can understand the culture of the communities that they, that they protect. So this report has been socialized throughout the communities, through all of those different entities, but even in the halls of Congress and on the desks of President Biden and President, Vice President Harris. And, and that's, that's outstanding. Can, can, you, can you give us, uh, the audience, some idea of some of the recommendations that you are making in the report? Sure. We were talking about, um, uh, let me think of something. Uh, so one thing we telling them, you know, to understand, so, you know, we have to acknowledge a problem before we, um, we resolve it and you can't minimize someone else's experiences. You cannot invalidate the experience of a black and brown citizen in this country, but you need to understand that my experiences are different from other people's experience, but you have to acknowledge that. So we, that's one of the things that we say, you have to not acknowledge the disinvestment uh, of what has happened. You can't understand if you've sat on this side and never gone through the things that a lot of these communities. So those are just tidbits that, you know what, let's sit down at a table reckoning. You don't have to agree, but you need to understand that my experiences are different and you don't get to invalidate or me because I say something different from you. And so we take those things and show even how you look at it from a different perspective. You know, you know, uh, even as I teach, uh, my mantra is respect that all of our experiences are different and everybody brings something to the table. But uh, just one other thing is how we have community chats, how we you know, establish these outreach with social services and on and on is an easy read. Uh, it's a very in-depth document, about 33 pages. And of course uh, you have it electronically, but these, you know, it's not one thing to fit all, but there's something in each of those recommendations that are applicable to many other communities throughout our country. Excellent. Let's, let's talk about one issue that has been a real problem with changing bad police behavior structure, even back in the days when I was a police officer. And it was the interaction between police unions and uh, the police department, the public, um, and where police unions would come in when there was a problem and would automatically make sure that that police officer got lawyered up, as they say, and, uh, um, and basically tried to put programs in place that, that would uh, make it difficult to be able to discipline police officers in the various police departments. What's going on with that now? You know, Paul summed it up real good that, you know, just the very history of law enforcement, uh, the playing fields were unlevel. And it is successful for what it was created to do and the statistics and the proof is in the pudding. You see who are, it leads us in mass incarceration, mass uh, arrest and interaction. So we have to change the behavior. And where did that start is now that, you know, we need to learn from the mistakes of the past. We cannot continue as is and expect a different outcome. And so with that, and at this pivotal time, and I do, I'm cautiously optimistic that a change is gonna come. You know, just like in the civil rights uh, era, uh, Noble was founded in 1976 and still as relevant 45 years later, but we have to change the way we think and behave and have that accountability and transparency that not only when an officer comes in through that immediate training, but they are continually trained. They are continually supervised. There's accountability and consequences. We can expect someone to respect us if they can't see and don't trust us. And so we have to do this whole over, overset of what, what has been and rethink how we're gonna do it. And you know, like, uh, you know, some people say it's bad apples, I say it's bad orchards. And of course, it's how we behave and that accountability and that training 
and 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 that trainer is just and Paul says so much, and I was like, okay, I can get off the call now. But society has been fearful of an African American man, of of black people in general, because we sometimes fear what we don't understand. But that that mindset has permeated over the history of our country, and that's why you see so often that there's a different interaction, even sometimes with non black and brown uh, perpetrators that are handled <laughs> so well. Whereas, you know, ours always end up deadly. And so it calls for us to overthink, uh, rethink how we're doing things, but that accountability and that training and that continuous training, you know, ideally we want law enforcement to be uh, reflective of the communities that we serve, but reality shows that a lot of times we can't get that. But even those officers that are assigned to that community, they have an onus and a responsibility to learn the culture so that they're not fearful of those individuals and on the return that they need to be engaged with law and with the community so that when the community does see law enforcement, it's not in an adversarial uh, uh, predicament. It's not uh, antagonistic, that they can see that law enforcement, me, we are the men and women that are mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters that go to the grocery store to go to the movies and that we are an extension and you should feel better knowing that instead of looking at like here come the police and run for them. So the onus is on us because we are the guardians and we're not warriors and we have to change the mentality uh. and our training from the military background to make it more community oriented but to make it more humanistic that we can respect each other and our differences. So um, thank you and, and, and I'm assuming from uh, your perspective then that, that you agree with Dr. Goff's theory of how to uh, deal with this issue of, uh, of police interactions that are resulting in deaths and injuries to African-American. Uh, Absolutely. Folks. It's the lack of training. It's their behavior. And if that behavior is not corrected, you know, it's known that they continue on. This is not something that just happened. You know, I think it comes even more uh, to, to the forefront with body cameras and thank God for a cell phone that has a camera. And so these things happen over and over, but now it's live and, and high definition that the world gets to see it. And of course, you know, things that, uh, you know, that are done in the dark continues in the dark until the light is brought upon them. So I think that, you know, a change is gonna come because, you know, in the 60s and, the, and 70s, yeah, we were integrated with other people that wanted to be, you know, that have a society that everyone can blossom. But even as we look back on last summer after the murder mm -hmm. of George Floyd, a lot of those demonstrators look like us on this camera. They came from different walks of life, black, white, whatever, because it's a human issue. But uh, the black community is the, you know, is the target of that. And until enough people get sick and tired of being sick and tired, and until we acknowledge you know, racism in our country, it'll be the demise of our country. Thank you. That, 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 what a great segue into Dave Wilkinson. Uh, Dave uh, and I go way back. I've known him for over 15 years or so. And uh, Dave is the CEO of the Atlanta Police Foundation. And, um, and, and it's a foundation that interacts directly with the, uh, many of the various issues we're talking about today and as they uh, resonate within the Atlanta Police Department. So Dave, uh, thanks for being here. Um, let's talk about, tell us about your interactions with the police department and uh, the Atlanta Police Foundation, what you're trying to accomplish. And um, are there any challenges or any frustrations in pursuing the goals you're trying to achieve? Thank you, Menard. Thanks for the question, and thanks for making me part of this uh, panel with these uh, distinguished uh, panelists. And I, I agree with pretty much everything Paul and Linda said on the call. And, and let me just say that you know the mission of the Police Foundation here, and my mission here in Atlanta, is pretty straightforward, and that is to create a safe city. And uh, in the aftermath of Ferguson, and in the aftermath, certainly of George Floyd. Uh, it sparked a lot of community conversations with police and, and, and the police foundation, obviously, and everyone in the community. And we found that everyone pretty much wanted the same thing. And that is they want a safe city and they want good policing. 
right? They want a safe city, they want good policing. And there was a lot of other rhetoric around defund the police and all that. But at the end of the day, that's what everyone wanted. And it was frustrating, of course, because since uh, Ferguson in 2015, I guess it was, that we have been fully committed to the idea of police reform, the de-escalation training, the implicit bias training. And I'm sure a lot of the police departments across the country have done that. So the Police Foundation is an organization that focuses on the strategy of public safety in our city, working with the police and the, and, and the political leaders and the community members to bring everybody together to build a safe city. And it's really not, no more complicated than that, although the execution can be quite messy and quite complicated. But at the end of the day, we invested heavily in these training programs. You know, you, you know, Linda talked a little bit about uh, de-escalation. I think Paul did as well in some of the training. And we talked a little bit about defund, defunding the police. And, you know, there's not a police officer out there, I don't think, that would suggest they need more investment in social programs. They need more social workers. A lot of these responses that they go out for on calls in the 1.4 million 911 calls they have here in Atlanta, uh, a social worker could certainly better be suited for those calls. But Linda made the good point. No social worker is gonna go out on those calls without a police officer with them. And cause these are messy. As a, as a former chief here in Atlanta used to say to me, um, you know, people don't call us to their birthday party. When we get there, there's a problem, right? Somebody's fighting, somebody's mad, somebody's got a knife, somebody's got a gun, somebody's arguing. And it's, it's always messy. So the frustrating thing for me, and I think most of the law enforcement have watched it, is this general feeling that, or perception maybe, that police officers don't agree with all this. And I think generally, every, the cops I do, do believe in this. They believe that there should be more of an investment in social workers and more investment in social programs. Because you know there's an old saying in law enforcement that you can't arrest your way out of a problem. And that's so true. I mean, that absolutely is true. There's also uh, a common conversation that in any public safety uh, think tank conversation I've ever been involved in. And that is, we would much rather invest in re rehabilitation over incarceration. I think that's sort of a given. But the system is somewhat broken. The criminal justice systems program, it, uh, cr criminal justice system, I'm sorry, is somewhat broken and it's very dysfunctional. Atlanta is like many other cities in this country that the criminal justice system relies on the city, the county, and the state to all come together and create function in what's a very dysfunctional process. And then, and then lastly, I'd just like to mention that the, uh, the issue of training, you know, when you, when you see the incidents of police brutality and the things that we've seen on TV that make police officers flinch and lose sleep at night to think about how could this happen, because most of them know they've never been in a, a meeting or conversation or a strategy session with police officers where anything like that was intentional, right? So it's a lack of training. It's a lack of, uh, of knowledge. Maybe it's a lack of culture within the police department. But it's frustrating when you think about how little effort our cities across the country have really given to police training, how little focus they've given to police training, Every time there's a budget tightening of the belt in major urban cities, they talk about police salaries, they talk about benefits. And I think everybody on this call probably knows that 95% of a city's budget for public safety typically goes to salary and benefits, at least 90%. So there's very little left for anything else. And rarely do you ever see a conversation about more investment in the training of police officers. Right, because you watch the incident uh, on the news and others, and says, I mean, that's what most cops look at. It. They go, "Boy, that's just not a good, uh, that's just not good training." Right, and most would say that's not intentional. Maybe it's systemic because it's gone gone on too long. And then the last thing, Bernard, I'd like to share is that from a cultural standpoint, building the culture of the police department is so critically important. Something we're doing here in the Police Foundation, for example, in Atlanta. Uh, making sure police officers live in the communities they serve. Atlanta's like every other big urban city in this country where less than 20% of the officers actually live in the city they serve. Now that cannot be good as you look to build the relationships and the trust between the community and the police officers. 
So we're all in on this issue right now. We're building police officer homes all over the city in our most challenged neighborhoods. We're putting police officers in apartment communities all over the neighborhood. We're even building a, an apartment complex in the most one of the more crime-ridden, challenged neighborhoods in our city. We're building this apartment complex so that every police recruit, when they go through the academy, they will live in this apartment complex. They will be assigned special projects working with community members. They will mentor the young men at the uh, at young men and women at the at Promise Center, which is our diversion program. And the idea is really this: as I, the chief and I often talk, and that is, we say that if you don't want to mentor the young men and women of the city of Atlanta, and if you do not want to serve your community, then you've got no business being an Atlanta police officer. So we're very proud of all that, and and it's it's frustrating to see what's happened over the last year because we felt like there was so much progress made in the city of Atlanta in good police reform. And certainly this has taken a couple of major steps back from what we've seen happen. And we're really proud of the, the effort of, uh, of the men and women of the Atlanta Police Department and the other law enforcement agencies. We believe that uh, it is not mutually exclusive to support police while at the same time, as Linda said, holding them accountable creating transparency. And I would argue that if we don't do that, we would do so at our own peril. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt that crime is trending up in every major city in this country. We're seeing crime rates here in Atlanta now we haven't seen in 20 years. Uh, we have citizens that are upset, concerned about this. And so we have no choice but to support the police. I think Paul said this in the beginning, support police officers support the funding of the police, support additional funding for these social programs, while at the same time, make sure we're investing in their training and make sure we're investing in proce the process in place that we hold them absolutely accountable at every point. Because if we do not support these police officers, the ranks of police departments across this country will continue to thin. Uh, unfortunately, we'll begin to hire a lesser quality candidate to be a police officer. And if all of a sudden you degrade these police forces across the country by hiring less officers, we have less officers on the street and we create, and we have less talented people in these positions, then we will pay for it in a big way. And so again, I'm happy to be part of this panel and uh, answer any other questions, Bernard, thank you. Well, uh, thanks, Dave. Let me, you, I don't want, to, want you to give your program short uh, shift here or shrift here. Um, you talked about the, the Promise Center and that is a diversion uh, program. Can you tell, tell the folks a little bit more about that program? Because I think it's significant. Yeah, thanks BT. As, as, as you could imagine, it, when we put these strategy sessions together, we get everybody in the room. And we came up with a statistic, two statistics that scared the hell out of me. And that was the first one was 60 to 70% of the crime in the city of Atlanta was committed by young people. It wasn't totally surprising, but it scared me. And then secondly, the recidivism rate for felony crimes in Fulton County, city of Atlanta was 88%. Now I'll repeat that, 88% of these young men and women that have committed a felony offense and that are left to the devices of the criminal justice system uh, in the state of Georgia reoffended 88% of the time in a five year period. So we got all the youth service organizations together in a room and we basically talked about, this is our biggest challenge. So we said, what if we, we already have programs for enforcement, that is the police arresting these kids, of course. We have prevention programs, your boys and girls clubs, your YMCAs, your after school programs, all great stuff, good people doing good work. But what about diversion programs? And there was sort of silence in the room. And I said, you know what I mean? And once a young man's been arrested for a felony offense, what are we doing to provide wraparound services to this young man to make sure we've changed that trajectory for that 88% recidivism rate? And someone raised their hand and said, well, we can't allow a kid like that in our center for liability reasons. And I said, wow, well, that's our sweet spot right there. If you're telling me that if a young man in the city of Atlanta commits a felony offense and all the youth service organizations are gonna turn away from them for liability reasons, and, I, and their recidivism rate is 88%, then I'm telling you the trajectory of that young man is gonna end up, he's gonna either end up dead or in prison or being chased around by police officers for the next 20 years. So we created a program called the At Promise Initiative. And At Promise is clearly a play on the word at risk, 
but it's we go into the most crime-ridden areas of our city and we create diversion centers. And these are youth centers where all the service providers can come together, Boys and Girls Club, Urban League, YMCA, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, all come under one roof. And the police foundation accepts the liability. And then kids are referred to this center by police officers when they arrest a young man. Instead of taking them to jail for a nonviolent offense, they can bring them to the youth center. When a judge can't figure out to do, what to do with the young men, they can send them to the center. When they're expelled from the Atlanta public schools, they can be sent to this center. So the amazing work is being done. We built the first center. We've now had 1,500 kids through that center. And the recidivism rate over three years now has been right at 5%. So the work is being done there is remarkable. But our challenge is, is great, though, because let me give you one more statistic. Yeah. For a kid to uh, take his GED programming and to get his GED degree, which is a big part of this, this training program, they have to read it. I believe it's the eighth grade level. And we have kids coming into that center that are 17, 18 year old reading at the second grade level. And so that is one of the biggest challenges. But the, the, the work being done there is tr tr dramatic. We have cities from all across the country coming to measure what we're doing there. And it's really all about changing the trajectory of these young people. And I think that is the most important thing we can do right now in public safety is change that relationship and change the trajectory of these young people in our communities. Thanks, Dave. You, you know, there, there are other issues I, I would love to discuss with all of our panelists, including Dave and the issue of just the fact that we have what 14, 1500 police officers in it in Atlanta right now. Well, and we have we have 2050 sworn, but we have 450 vacancies as we sit here today. Yeah. So about 1600 sworn or currently. And, and that, yeah. And that's a city where you, you can have millions of people in the city on any particular day. That, that's that's just absolutely ridiculous. Um, and and I know you have a training program also with the Civil Rights Museum, but, but we need to get to other folks and we can talk about that another time. Um, and I know we've got another, a number of questions. I mean, it looks like they're, they're really kicking up. So um, Charles is gonna jump all over me if I don't let him get to the questions pretty quickly. Uh, but we, we haven't spoken about qualified immunity. And I wonder if one of you all can just give us a very quick view of what qualified immunity is. Uh, why it's a problem, and um, uh, what's going on in the Congress about it now. Linda, I think you and I may have talked about that. Is that you or Paul? So even as a, 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 a doctrine, not a law, um, that protects uh, civilly, not criminally, um, noble sense is that we need to revisit that. We need to limit that, not to go from 100 to zero, but let it be a modification as we understand that. Most police officers go out there every day to do their jobs and do it in good faith. And they want to know that they're covered and doing their jobs. And so it's not a blanket where one can hide behind when there's you know, bad habits or whatever. Um, so even as we go forth, let's revisit this, you know, what it's meant to be, but let's look at the statistical data. How many departments actually have qualified immunity cases? And it's not many because we show that you know, when officers are tried, it's usually for criminal behavior and this is not you know, a blanket for that. Um, so even mm -hmm. as it was created and the very mm -hmm. origin just so that even during the freedom fighters time that you know, they couldn't bring a lawsuit against those people that was perpetuating those treatment against them. Uh, it, is, it has a mindset that you know, this is our, our super cape and you know, dare you take it away. But in essence, it does not do what everybody thinks. It does give that officer that good faith to operate their job, you know, handle their job and be operational without the fear of retaliation on that. But again, let's look at it, let's revisit the language. And of course, we want to protect those men and women out there doing their jobs and doing it to the best of their abilities. And so when we talk about qualified immunity, it's not this big doctrine that everybody thinks that saves the whole world in law enforcement. Because again, there has to be accountability and transparency. It's not something that you hide behind because you, you know, you're doing wrong. So uh, we talked about that in our task force report, but even still as it's being pushed right now, um, you know, some people want to do absolutely do away with it. And some people think, oh, how dare, you know, you touch it. But we need to revisit the language and give an education because everybody don't even understand it. And it was to protect the office civilly, 
not criminal. Thank you very much. And, and, I, and, I, and I'm certain that most of our audience learned something there about the fact that it doesn't cover criminal liability exposure, just civil liability exposure. That's great. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna shut up and and let Charles jump in because I I I'm, uh, I know he's got a bunch of questions. We, we got some great questions about. here, Bernard. So yeah. I, I appreciate it. And this this conversation is great. I, the first question is from Thaddeus Johnson, who's an associate professor of criminology at Georgia State University here in Atlanta, and a former Memphis City policeman himself. And he asked the following. Um, that police evaluations in, and incentive structures often emphasize warrior outcomes, which in fact is a small part of the job. Um, how, what behaviors should be measured and included in evaluations uh, to help mitigate low level enforcement that drives disparity and often serves as, as triggers for use of force events. And um, Professor Butler, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to, to take a crack at that. So President Obama's commission on 21st century policing suggested that one problem with policing is workplace culture. And in fact, too many departments and too many officers think of themselves as warriors, as us against them, with them being the citizens that they're supposed to serve and protect. So the model that President Obama's commission recommended was guardian. And if you think of the person who's applying for a job to be a guardian rather than a warrior, she's going to have an entirely different skill set and values and hopes about what she can accomplish on the job. We have a wonderful training program at Georgetown Law School for rookie police officers who come to our campus once a month to get extra training. They learn about some issues you'd hope rookies would learn about in the academy, but they often don't. So our students learn about the history of policing, about race relations, about gentrification. They spend the night in a homeless shelter. They learn. And so to the question about incentives, we're hoping that these folks are going to be the leaders in DC and in national policing in a few years. And we had a, a, an amazing moment with a, a former police chief who came to talk to our rookie cops. And one of our cops mentioned something that's so relevant to this question. Uh, this young man told the police chief that he's privileged to be a police officer in the neighborhood that he grew up in. And he said he knows these kids. And in the District of Columbia, it's legal to possess marijuana, but you can't smoke weed outside. And this rookie says sometimes he sees kids or young people smoking. And he says what he does is to go over to them and say, man, you know you're not supposed to be doing that. And they respond, yeah, man, we know. And they put out the cigarette they put the weed away. And what does this cop do? He walks away. And he told the chief, I think that that is good policing. He says, I should get rewarded for that just the same as if I had made an arrest. Sound like your grandmother, I muted myself. Uh, I apologize. Uh, Paul, how are, how are people selected for the program and who funds it? And how does how do the police force do without those officers while they're in training? So it's a fellowship that rookie cops have to apply. So classes, rookie uh, uh, classes at the academy in DC can be as many as 200. We take about 25%. And again, they come to the law school once a month. They also 
once a month, work on a capstone project, uh, doing something for the community in, in ways that sound similar to some of the uh, work that Dave described going on in Atlanta. And they get a certificate after the two years with Georgetown Law's name on it. Uh, we have some amazing young people who are going into law enforcement in the District of Columbia. And, and, and when these young women and men get to be leaders, uh, look out. It's going to be a whole different ballgame. Uh, we, we've got more questions than we are going to be able to get through. So I'm going to try to ask them fast and ask all that. And I know it's hard to, to give short answers to complicated questions. Edvige Jean-Francois asks, how do you train police officers to police their own? And she uses an example, the, the policeman who did not intervene when Derek Chauvin was uh, smothering George Floyd and the recent video of Ronald Green being brutalized. I mean, what, what, what's, what's gone wrong there? And how do you train Rook junior officers to intervene if when it's a senior officer who is um, obviously doing something wrong? And Dave, let me, let me ask you that question. Oh, well, thank you, Charles. And obviously that's a big deal. And, and it's a big part of the training efforts and the leadership training for the police department. So I'll try to give as short an answer as I can. And that is, uh, we had a conference uh, just last week with all the leadership within the Atlanta Police Department. And that was the primary topic right there. But the answer is, is very simple. These officers need to have the courage that they, uh, the department and the city will have their back if they come forward against another officer. And they have to be willing to intervene, obviously, when they see something's out of place. So I think it's just part of the training and part of the culture again. And I think, I would assume, just like Atlanta, every police department in the country right now is making that a top priority. Okay. That's, and that's Charles, great. Charles, this is Bernard. Yeah. You don't know this, but Georgetown has an innovative policing program that deals with this situation also. And Paul's part of that program. Oh, that's, that's terrific. Um, uh, President Williams, let me ask you this. Uh, as a professional person who lives in Detroit, Michigan, what can I do to educate young people if they are arrested? I have a new college grad in my home. Unfortunately, we have to have that talk. We have to have the real talk about what life is uh, outside of the doors of our home. Uh, respect. And even when, when you're disrespectful, to still remain respectful, to live, to be able to challenge that, to be able to report that. You know, it's, it's, it's easier, you know, an illustration of that is when that lieutenant, that army lieutenant, he did everything correct, but he recorded that and he lived to talk about it. So again, I tell my students, don't fight with the cops on the street because you're not gonna win live to talk about it. So you have to teach people to, to be respectful, to talk to people like you want to be talked, uh, spoken to. And that, you know, uh, a kind word kind of de-escalates, but when you go toe to toe, normally you're not gonna win. And even Noble has a program called the Law in Your Community, that we go out through the community from elementary school up to, you know, adults to tell them how to, what their rights are and how to interact in these types of situations. So you just have to be candid and tell them that we live in a world that we are judged differently and that this is how you navigate those, those, those currents. Well, that, that makes me ask, what do you, what do you, I mean, it sure seems like police and enforcing crime that are, that are misdemeanors, traffic stops, minor crimes, and they end up in violent confrontations um, tragically with people being killed. Uh, George Floyd with a, what was possibly a, 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 a fake $20 bill. Um, the, the traffic stop where the, you know, the, the officer coming home from his reserve training is beat up by a policeman, two policemen in, in uh, Virginia outside a military base. What, what is going on there that such, I mean, suppose meaning not meaningless but minor crimes result in such abuse of authority it's from the leadership down as they've stated dave and i being former uh, secret service agents which uh, counterfeit investigations was our cornerstone one i know dave nor i could go back to our field office and say that we've shackled somebody and let alone kill them 
for the, uh, the last twenty dollar pass. I don't care if it was twenty thousand. Uh, there's that accountability, and there's consequences for that bad behavior. And of course, you now we hear that you know you see something, say something. Isn't it sad that we have now have to put that in writing and to enforce that when that's something that we're supposed to be doing anyway? So it's that accountability that you know from the top down that down that there's no tolerance for such behavior and of course make examples you know they showed long time ago that there was an officer i think she was in brooklyn and she was fired and her her pension was suspended because she did intervene she was before her time and years later most recently she just you know got the reinstatement of that make an example of that we don't award reward bad behavior and we have to show that consistently to realize that this culture has to change it's like if you go into a store for customer service, you're not going to let a person treat you uh, disrespectful and you're paying them and speak, speaking to them. Law enforcement is public servant. We have a right and an onus to just respect the people. If you don't want to deal with people, don't be in law enforcement. Don't be in public safety because guess who your customers are? Ta -da! So accountability and let's just hold each other responsibility. And, you know, this new generation Let's see something, let's say something, challenge it. And you know, I'll tell anybody, as long as you stand up for what's right, you'll have more people fighting for you to uphold and protect you. Wow, that's great. Um, Ken Hardy asked, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rephrase the question a little bit, Paul, um, and about systemic, he says people are over applying the term systemic racism. And I guess I guess down to what, is, what does systemic racism really mean? Um, and he uses the example of Atlanta, where he says black on black crime hits elderly and youth especially hard. Um, says in Atlanta, the city leadership has been black for decades, and the majority of APD Atlanta Police Department officers are black. Does is there less abuse of authority by black officers than white officers? The I'll let somebody else before I take it all. <laughs> no, okay. I'm, I'm asking. I'm asking Professor Butler this one. Okay. So the evidence suggests that in order for police departments and officers to serve the whole community, they have to represent the community. They have to look like the community. And so in the District of Columbia, our African-American citizens are actually overrepresented on the police force. The Black folks are about 50% of the population of DC and somewhere around 60% of the officers on the Metropolitan Police Department. And I believe that African-Americans are also very well represented in the Atlanta Police Department. But as we all know from the headlines, the Atlanta Police Department, the Washington Police Department, they have some of the same problems as all of the other departments. So it's a necessary condition that police departments be diverse and look like the citizens that they serve, but it's not a sufficient condition in order for police officers to command the respect of citizens. Uh, for that to happen, uh, we have to think about all of these reforms uh, that folks have been talking about. And when people mention uh, some of the data about the risk that Black people have for being victims of crime, well, we can't separate that from the concerns about policing. Uh, I tell my students, when you think about how to police make serious cases, don't think about a show like Hawaii Five-0 where the cops are running and chasing down the bad guy. Uh, I say, Think about law and order. On that show, what we see the cops doing is going from one office talking to people to somebody's house talking to people uh, to someone's school. That's how the police solve serious crimes. And if your experience with the cops is they're the ones who arrested your grandbaby for no reason, you're not going to want to cooperate. When something goes down, everybody knows who did it. Many people know who did it. But again, if your experience is uh, they ran up to you and pushed you against the wall, patted you down, and then left without saying a damn word, you're not going to want to talk to them when they come knocking at your door. 
Uh, Dave Wilkinson, let me ask you about police staffing. Um, I just I read that uh, in the past year, a number of Milwaukee police have left the force. Um, you, you mentioned earlier that the Atlanta police force is 400 people short uh, from, from its authorized level. Is that happening across the country? And how much of that is a, re I mean, I assume there's a normal turnover in police officers to begin with. But how much of that is reaction to uh, the public outcry over the past year about uh, abuse of authority by police? Well, thanks, Charles. The, the normal attrition rate for a major city police department is 5 to 7%. And that's sort of what we measure against. But after the, pro, the George Floyd, pro, Floyd protest, excuse me, in the summer, police officers in Atlanta began walking off the job, leaving the job. Police recruits didn't show up for the academy the next, the next day. We had officers that went down with a so-called uh, nervous breakdowns. We had officers threatening to kill themselves. You name it, basically. Uh, this police department began to, uh, the, the attrition numbers went up in a major way. And uh, we lost the vast majority of those officers in the last six months of last year. One particular incident, I don't need to remind the audience, but these officers had already gone through six or seven months of COVID where the rest of us were all working off Zoom calls and working from home and they're out on the streets, you know, trying to mm -hmm. protect the citizens. And then the protests happened here in Atlanta. There's one particular commander told me this story that one night all the protesters in unison basically said one, two, three, and spitting in officer's face all at the same time. Now that was all during COVID. And that's just an example of, the, of what these guys had to go through. So it's only natural that they left the force. But more importantly, a mother told me this. And that was the first thing I did was told my son, you've got to find something else to do for a living. You need to get out of that profession and go do something else. So it, you realize now you've got uh, the profession now that has been downgraded in everybody's mind, basically police officers that were called to serve, wanting to create a, a career of public service, now questioning that. So yes, Charles, the police department, uh, the damage was done in a major way obviously to the morale and the overall attrition numbers of the police force. But make no mistake, the challenges and the reason the crime, one of the big reasons crime is up so high at this point in our city is your first measure against crime is police staffing or police visibility through police patrols. You put police officers in uniforms and marked patrol cars for a reason. If they're patrolling up and down the street, they deter criminal activity and they deter crime. Also give them enough police officers to appropriately respond to the 911 calls when the calls come out. So at the end of the day, all of a sudden you take 400 officers off the street, you barely have enough officers to respond to the 911 calls. So therefore, and then they have getting, getting backed up on the 911 calls. So the deterrence mechanism goes away. And then I would even argue community policing, which is so incredibly important. And it shouldn't be just a slogan, it should be part of the culture of the police department, as Paul mentioned, and I think Linda did as well. But yet all of those programs are difficult to address if the officers are chasing the 911 calls to the point where they don't even have the bandwidth in, in the manpower to do that. So I would say police staffing is a critical issue in this city and every other city. And again, remind everyone that supporting the police, supporting our effort to have a better quality of police officer and more police officers on the street and holding them accountable and creating transparency should not be considered mutually exclusive. And that's what we're committed to here in Atlanta. Okay. Um, and I, I assume, Dave, that police officers, it's not hard to find another job in a neighboring police force. Is that is that right? Well, it's certainly not hard now, Charles, because as you can imagine, in the state of Georgia, they require 408 uh, hours of training to be a certified police officer in the state of Georgia. The Atlanta police officers go through over 900 hours of training. So you already had a scenario where everybody wants to hire the Atlanta police officers, right, uh, away. And now if you have a big urban city where uh, maybe uh, support is is not been as, as good as it should have been for the officers, at least in the eyes of the officers from the, from the po political establishment, from the city itself, uh, 
then that's a big challenge, right? And so these officers are going to leave, but the answer to your question is no, they can easily find jobs in other, but a lot of these guys are leaving the profession altogether. Mm -hmm. And then some are leaving for, let's just say smaller police departments that are in, they would argue more supportive of their role as a police officer. Well, um, Linda, can you talk about, I mean, how would it work having social workers rather than police responding to homelessness, responding to uh, mental health issues. I mean, a police officer has to go with them, presumably. Um, so, how, how, so how, how would it work in reality? And there are several people have asked variations of that question. As we have projected in, in my task force is a crisis intervention team. And a team is just that it, it is uh, composed of different individual with different functions. Um, we want to align to make sure those professionals that need to be there are, are present. Uh, law enforcement is there as one, one part of that pie. So if it has the propensity to elevate to something you know violent or dangerous, then law enforcement is there. But just being there and having the right professionals there is that in, that's that integration of the right individuals responding there that we will minimize our footprint without jeopardizing the safety and security. So again, it's a collaborative effort, just like a team. Everybody is important on that team, although they have different positions. And so even instill that, instead of law enforcement taking the whole pie, we're dividing the pie up because it takes the whole pie to serve the community. And, and Charles, you, you, I, I think you and I have talked about this once before. In Atlanta, we had that program back in, night, in the 80s where um, social workers, it was really only two or three, would ride with police officers to those kinds of, of you know, encounters or calls. And they had to uh, eliminate the program because they ran out of money. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Butler, I'm gonna end with you. The, President Biden has called for the passage of, of the George Floyd Act, um, and it hoped that it would be passed by today, passed in the House, but not in the Senate. I mean, what would it do? I mean, if, if this were passed, I mean, if you've got 18,000 police forces um, that are not supervised by the federal government, how would that impact police forces across the country? 18,000 different police departments and 18,000 different ways of policing. There are national standards for what can go in a can of tuna fish. No national standards for the people who are, are licensed to kill regarding training, competency. And our federalist system of government is why policing is local. And in many ways, that's good news for citizens. Uh, I tell people all the time, it doesn't matter whether Donald Trump or Joe Biden is president. Uh, the mayor is the boss of the police chief. And if you want to change policing, you need to influence her, the mayor, and the chief more than the attorney general or the president. At the same time, that local structure makes it hard to impose common sense national standards. So what the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act does is to say to local police departments, if you want money from the feds, you have to follow our rules. Mm -hmm. Basic common sense requirements like a database for bad apple cops, bans on chokeholds, making it easier to hold police officers who cross the line accountable. Well, I mean, I'm gonna ask you the question that obviously, why are, why are people opposed to that? I mean, you, you would think if that, that would get, you know, hundreds out of a hundred senators would support that, but that certainly does not appear to be the case because they don't listen to Linda. Uh, they don't listen to the people who have the most expertise on the policies. And so I'm distressed that one reason that the bill is stalled in Congress is because a lot of police organizations 
have come out against it or have concerns about issues like qualified immunity. And sometimes it gets pitched as activists versus the police, but that's why it's so important to understand that Linda represents the police, that BT and Dave represent the police and the police are not a monolith on these issues. And there are lots of organizations like Noble that are calling for the same accountability and transparency as the activists. Wow, that's great. I, I wanna thank you. This has been tremendous. We, I would love to go on longer. Um, unfortunately, we cannot. Uh, it's 1.15, one I've had you on here for an hour and 15 minutes. Um, I hope we can do this again at some point because this has been really useful. I wanna thank the, the three of you and Bernard Taylor, our moderator, who's done a better job at moderating than I usually do. Um, I've got three requests for our audience members. Please join the World Affairs Council if you're not a member. And I've got people on here from World Affairs Councils in Boston and Dallas and Connecticut and join your World Affairs Council in, in your hometown as well. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, we'll post this on our YouTube channel this afternoon, but if you subscribe, you'll know when it drops and you can share this video with your, with your friends and colleagues. And please invite your friends to join one of our programs. We've got a counterpart program to this coming up on June 9th, which I hope all of you will attend. And it's on racism, a serious public health crisis. And we've got a tremendous panel of experts. I'm not gonna run through their names right now, but including the Associate Director of the CDC for the Office of the Deals with this within the CDC. Her name is Dr. Linda LeBert. Um, and so that's on June 9th. Please subscribe to that. Uh, I would like you to attend next week on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. We've got a program from noon to 1.30 each day on global health, the race to beat COVID. Um, I'm, I'm not going to read it to you now, but you're going to love it. Please attend. I want to thank the World Affairs Councils who have publicized this program to their members. I want to thank all of you in the audience who have uh, participated in this. We're going to take the questions, send them to each of the speakers so that they've, they've got the questions, both the ones that I asked and the ones we weren't able to get to. There's a whole bunch we didn't get to. Thanks to Valerie Lopez de Frank, our producer, to Laura Brower, our social media specialist, and Rennie, our program director, and our summer intern, Josephine Steenbergen, a student at Emory University. And I want to thank you again, Professor Paul Butler, Dave Wilkinson, and uh, President Linda Williams. This has been a really uh, important and informative hour and 15 minutes. This has been great. And I think we need to do this again. Bernard, thanks for having the great idea of doing this. All right. Well done. There are Good. solutions to the problems. You well, there's got to be. But, yeah. the, but, but I, I, here, here's my, I'm going to preach a little bit right now. Part <laughs> of the solution is understanding that issues are not binary. Yep. Right? That's right? That they're not black and white, off and on, yes or no that every issue, certainly in my personal life, and, I, and it certainly is true in public policy, is that issues are complicated. And the closer you get to them, the more granularity you have, the, the more complicated it is. And I, I, I take my hat off to Paul and, and Linda, who've been on TV already today, but to, to, to boil down tough issues into a soundbite, in a way, is a disservice to the, to the issue itself and to finding a solution. I mean, it's, it's, it's great. It's what our media requires. And I'm sure, I mean, y'all are great at it, but it requires people thinking and talking about this with their friends and neighbors and not assuming that the person who disagrees with you is, is a jerk. And um, <laughs> that's what our country has come to. Anyhow, thank you all. I appreciate all y'all. I appreciate the questions that uh, you have sent in. Thank you very much. And I hope to see everybody on July 9th to talk about health and racism, the, the counterpart program to this. Thanks again. Everybody have a good Take afternoon. Take care, folks. Thank you all very much. Bye.